Welcome to another episode of the Huxley Morton podcast, the show where in 2021, I'm bringing you interviews with some of the world's most ambitious pharma company owners, industry leaders, suppliers, innovators, who have all agreed to share their stories of both personal and professional growth. Uh, this week, I'm joined by Jeff Trotter. Uh, Jeff is Senior Vice President at Worldwide Clinical Trials. Um, definitely has a bit of an entrepreneurial background that he can um, share with us. It's, it's quite unique. Uh, Jeff, uh, welcome to the show. I'm loving that the background uh, that you had there, quite apt seeing as um, when you and I uh, had our intro call, um, you, uh, uh, you were off skiing yourself in, in Aspen, if I'm correct. Yeah, yeah. I uh, try to get out to Colorado as often as I can, although I'm uh, right now based back in the Chicago area. Sure. Uh, well, look, um, as I say, so you are the Senior Vice President at, at Worldwide Clinical Trials, but I know that there's different verticals that the, the, the company covers. Give us a bit more of an intro as to, to your role uh, and what you're covering um, as, as SVP, as it may be. Sure. So um, my focus is on the area that I've really focused on the last uh, 30 years or so. It seems like 100 years, but let's call it 30. Uh, it's all, actually, it's a, a unit we call Worldwide Evidence. Mm -hmm which reflects uh, this whole concept of real world evidence. So my role is uh, you know, providing kind of scientific support and leadership for uh, a group actually that I brought over to Worldwide about three years ago. Um, yeah. Worldwide acquired a, a part of a company that I, that I co-founded. Mm -hmm. So the focus of real world evidence is, is kind of non-traditional clinical research. If most of what we as a company, as a CRO do, is, is more traditional randomized clinical trials uh, that support regulatory approval. Mm -hmm. Most of what we do is, most of what we do in the evidence group is focused on more discretionary work to focus on a product's value in the real world. Does it really work mm -hmm. in the more, um, you know, in the more um, uh, heterogeneous environment of, of the real world, the actual medical practice? Does the product yeah. work? Uh, can it be associated with some economic value? How do patients feel about it? Uh, even some of the safety issues are important in the real world. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's something that we work, uh, we work regularly with uh, medical affairs professionals, health economics people, outcomes research, and this growing world of, of real world evidence. Um, although we work quite a bit with clinical operations people and with people on the commercial side. We're, so we're very much... Uh, I think on a daily basis, walking the uh, the tightrope between the the people that reside on the traditional land masses of of clinical development and commercial development. Mm -hmm. Okay, well look, that's uh, I guess interesting to hear, and I guess that when it's when we're talking real world, everything eventually ends up, or anything that goes for FDA approval and, and and gets out there is in the real world. So I guess you are linked to various different sub um, departments within the business, um, and and have links there all over, right? Yeah, correct. I mean, everything we do, we do studies that do reflect what happens in the real world, but they have to be undertaken in a scientific, structured manner. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's finding that balance between not interfering with what we're observing. If we really want to observe the real world, we don't want to change the real world, but to capture data in a, in a high quality manner uh, so that the data that we're ultimately putting into our reports is of truly of value to our clients and to uh, the, the scientific communities beyond. So yeah, we, we tap into our, uh, our teams in statistics and data management, site activation, periodically regulatory. And, mm. um, and so yeah, we're in many ways, we're kind of a CRO within a CRO, but right. we benefit from the larger um, infrastructure of the, of the organization, as well as the, the medical and scientific expertise that we've got on a broad basis. Sure. Well, look, obviously, you know, you're now acting as a, the, the senior vice president over there. You know, your career has, you know, some would say gone very well. Uh, but as I sort of um, hinted at, you know, with the, the intro for yourself, you do have a bit of an, an entrepreneurial aspect uh, to how your career has gone. Uh, and you touched on it, you know, in, in the sense that uh, Worldwide Clinical Trials has actually bought out a company you were part owner founder of um so let's just to, to kind of recap uh, and go back through the years as it may be a little bit um you know did you always want to go down this route um you know how did your career sort of start out where did the uh, interest in in healthcare and clinical trials where did that first come from yeah where did i go wrong 
Um, <laughs> I, I think back, um, James, to yeah, some of the seminal events of, of really, you know, in my life 20, 30 years ago, and even be, beyond that, going back into um, uh, undergrad and, and grad school. Undergrad, I started out as a uh, a pre-med major, I think mm. largely because that's what my brother did. And I figured, well, you know, that's, that's good enough reason. Yeah. Um, after I got terrible grades in biology, I said, maybe we need to rethink this strategy. And, mm. and um, my father had always been a, a healthcare administrator. So on the business side of healthcare. Yeah. And he um, strongly encouraged me to get a, a business degree and then you know we, we figure out the rest from there so mm. I actually did shift from biology into accounting which is a quite a transformation not the most elegant one yeah but um but when I think about that transformation that's that's kind of reflective of, of my career since then it's always been kind of flitting back and forth between the science side and the business side or at least the uh, financial side of business mm. um after uh, grad school, I started out in management consulting for healthcare providers, for hospitals, managed care organizations, uh, home health care. And, uh, and in the mid 80s, when uh, the reimbursement system in the US changed from one of, of cost reimbursement to fixed reimbursement, essentially fixed prices for uh, a specific procedure or a specific set of, uh, of treatments. Mm hospitals became much more focused on this issue of cost effectiveness. How can I maintain the same outcomes and, and maximize the quality of the outcomes while controlling costs? Now they had an absolute incentive to, uh, to control costs. Mm -hmm. and, and at that point, I, I, I really made the transition from working on the provider side to the supplier side. I was intrigued by um, this, the pharmaceutical industry, which I really didn't know much about, but I used to see ads in advertisements in healthcare journals talking about the safety and efficacy of a particular drug. Well, when this reimbursement change came in, mm. the next day they were talking about the safety and effectiveness and the cost effectiveness of a drug. And I didn't see a lot of... So you uh, just hadn't, hadn't noticed that pro up until that point, no? Say again? I said, so you just, that just wasn't noticed and, and, and relevant up until that point, until that change it, came in. It wasn't to me. I mean, I was focused on the provider side, but, but I knew when this issue was, uh, uh, came into place from a regulatory standpoint, from a um, reimbursement regulatory standpoint, mm. healthcare providers would need to do something differently. And again, I started noticing the, the pharmaceutical industry and this concept of cost effectiveness that you know, can we deliver the same quality outcomes, but at a better overall cost? Yeah. And, and I didn't see a lot of substantiation behind these assertions that the pharma industry were, were making about cost effectiveness. Mm -hmm. And so ar around that time, I had switched uh, positions. I went to a small management consulting company. And, and I started to think a little bit about how we might be able to get involved in actually selling more work for providers. But to start really bridging gaps between providers and pharma companies. Mm. So I, I, I created a, a journal, basically, a very small quarterly journal, uh, not so cleverly called the Journal of Cost-Effective Products and Technologies. And in it, what we would do is send At it out it to said, all the said what it did. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> indeed. We didn't want to mince words. So we sent it out to all the hospitals in the US. And in it, we put little, like, three-page synopses of... Uh, highlighting something that we found in the pharmaceutical industry or that a, a pharma company would send to us saying, look, mm. here's the assertion we've made about our, our product and we think it's cost effective. And can you help us translate it for more of a financial uh, um, decision maker as opposed to a traditional clinical decision maker? Mm. And what happened very frequently was pharma companies would call us up and we'd say, look, we'd like to get in your journal we think our product's cost effective, but we've never done really any research. We've never really examined the implications in a, in a structured manner. Yeah. Uh, can you help us out? Mm. So, pardon me. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, we, uh, that's when I kind of applied my understanding of cost accounting and a little bit of understanding of, uh, of science and started developing methodologies to look at the cost effectiveness of, uh, of medical products and, and pharmaceuticals. Mm. And, um, 
kind of created a, a, a practice in that area, went on to another management consulting firm, and then a few years later started my own company. And um, we, uh, I, I stayed with that for about 17 years. About halfway through, we got acquired by a, a large CRO, and then we uh, I essentially bought the company back. It just wasn't, um, you know, working the way anybody wanted to. Yeah. Um, so when when it when it came off that you were going to start um, sort of your own um, company, um, was it just yourself, or, or was there was there others involved in in that in terms of you know the the um, the journal that you were putting out um, there and and the advice that you were giving to these pharma companies about um, the cost effectiveness of, of their drugs. Was, yeah. it, was it just yourself or did you, was there, you know, a, a demand for it where you had to take on uh, others? Well, I didn't want to put anybody else at risk other than myself, although it really wasn't that tough of a decision. Mm. Again, I had been with a large management consulting firm. I was doing this kind of work, Yeah. but uh, there did seem like an opportunity for the clients that I was talking to to say, look, Jeff, why don't they, many of them actually said, why don't you just start your own shop? Really? So I did. Uh, very quickly thereafter, however, I realized that I, I, I needed some help. And so, uh, you know, brought on uh, a staff uh, one by one. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't grow that quickly, but that was fine. There, this was kind of the early days of this whole field of what somebody would call pharmacoeconomics. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then uh, I think, again, sold the company uh, when we were about 10 people because we were starting to be asked to do true, true um, uh, prospective studies. And with, with 10 people, we really couldn't pull that off. Yeah. So we needed a, a bit of a big brother and it was a, they were looking for companies like ours as well. And, uh, and actually that, that theme has repeated itself a few times in my career mm. uh, as well. But, um, but yeah, you know, it was a good opportunity to take full responsibility for anything we were, uh, we were delivering to clients and, and running a, a small operation like that. Actually, we, after we regained uh, our own uh, independence, we grew it to about 120 people or so. Opened up an wow. office in San Francisco, and and you know it was a, a a real privilege for me to run an organization like that to mm. absolutely embrace responsibility and for everything we were doing. Um, we had this uh, motto where we were kind of quote unquote just so consulting, where everything every little detail was really critical. And that was mm. um, something that we are to this day, uh, quite quite proud of our uh, anal retentiveness. And, and um, how, because yeah. that sounds like you, you know, I mean, some people would say, you know, some of the huge organizations out there would say 120 is not, not many. Other organizations, a lot of companies struggle to get beyond 50. Um, you know, so 120, to, you know, to me, that sounds quite a, a big responsibility for yourself sat at the top of, of, of that. Um, how did you go about, um, I guess, managing it? Were you still doing kind of the day-to-day -day work um, because that's what clients expected of you? Or did you have to de delegate to sort of deputies at that point? Well, that's a good question. I mean, my, my wife would probably say that if it wasn't for her, we would not have had uh, any financial help. And, and indeed, she's the uh, accountant in the family that really knows what she's doing. So yeah. she was kind of our part-time CFO. Mm. But you know, it wasn't really that difficult, James, in, in managing managing an organization like that. I mean, everybody that we, and we had a management team of, I think, about seven, seven VP, senior VP levels. Yeah. Um, the commonality was that we were focused on doing the right thing for the clients. And, and also, I think, maintain a very strong culture where everybody, you know, we didn't take ourselves overly seriously. I, I you know, I, I uh, did not necessarily comfortably like the title of boss. And I think, you know, my colleagues would, would agree that we were mm. a very democratic organization. Uh, but still, when you focus on the clients and you focus on the people and people are inspired to do the right thing, you know, it's, it's not necessarily uh, Harvard Business uh, 101, but everything mm. else kind of falls into place from an economic standpoint. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree, you know, you know, when I started, the business it, um, for us at Huxley Morton, it was kind of through demand, you know, clients that had said, you know, hey, why don't you start doing this yourself? Um, but I never liked the idea of, of being 
kind of the, the the boss i guess you know back where i was working for organizations i was always a little bit of a, a maverick you know i would do things my own way and you know i kind of got away with it because i was a top performer uh, but then to almost go away and, and then have to have wear that boss hat it was a little bit strange for me um and the way i've always tried to do it is just to try and lead by example to an extent it sounds like that's what what you have have done where you're you're more of a leader not necessarily a boss and, and people can come to you you know open door policy and, and things like that by um by what you're outlining there yeah i think that's fair it's uh, again i um yeah you know it was it was my company but i you know we we shared the uh, the benefits mm. uh, um, across the board and and um but no i i think the culture that we had was very very positive it's very hard to replicate that culture but nice along the way we also developed a an outstanding reputation um, mm. you know this field was starting to grow uh, pretty dramatically and our focus was always on you know, even though there were a lot of people in the field that were PhDs in economics and a lot of advanced degrees, we were kind of uh, had our feet firmly on the ground and really focused very much on strategic issues. Clients mm -hmm. would come to us and would say, you know, we'd like to we'd like to figure out how to demonstrate the value of our product or the cost effectiveness of uh, of our product. Can you guys help us this afternoon? Mm. And and inevitably, we'd always uh, I think to a person take a step back and say, all right, let's. Help us understand really what your situation is. What are, what's your overall strategy? You know, why are you undertaking this product? Tell me a little bit more about it so that we can be sure. good consultants before we're good researchers. Okay, and, and yeah, no, I, I guess kind of makes sense. And, and did, did you find that you were running into people with the, the same challenges and issues time and time again? Or was it, you know, each individual client was would, would pose different questions and different challenges to you? The themes were the same, um, and again, I you know I mentioned earlier that that we've always been on this tightrope between the the clinical and commercial landmass. That's that's always been a really important theme for us. We try to be very diplomatic. We try to recognize that this issue and the research underlying the issue of, of real world value, cost effectiveness, clinical effectiveness in the real world, is is a little bit outside many people's comfort zones. Clinical researchers are used to the the much more black and white scenario of, a, of an experimental clinical trial. Mm. And uh, on the commercial side, you know, again, they may not be as, as accustomed to the scientific method. In the middle where we are, we want to make sure we're doing things scientifically, but we don't want to compromise strategy at the same time. Mm. And it's a, it's a delicate balance. We, um, I think if there's one thing we did well that, that uh, everyone in the organization was comfortable with, it was Again, acknowledging the this comfort zone of our clients, trying to trying to make sure that we weren't rocking their world too much, but at the same time helping them in many ways articulate the questions that they want to have answered. Mm. Uh, so again, we always had this strategic uh, foundation for what we did, but at the end of the day, it was so that the research could be undertaken in the most appropriate manner, and uh, and so that. You know, two years down the road, when the studies were done, when the analyses were done, nobody was scratching their head and saying, "Well, why the heck did we do this project in the first place?" We mm. we tried to resist that uh, that that issue. Sure. Well, it sounds as as you say, uh, you know, it sounds like there's a very fine line between between yeah, getting someone to do what they need to do and, and change the, the the way that they've been doing it because often you know just with anything in life, there's normally a, a bit of a reluctance to change, um, and almost getting people to, to come to that decision themselves is kind of an art really, isn't it? it? That's a very good way to characterize it. It's, it's an art, it's a science, it's technical, uh, it's strategic, but, uh, but again, many companies still ask their traditional clinical researchers to do these observational studies, patient registries that are really focused on documenting how products are used in the real world. Mm. And inevitably, because that, that's the way they've been classically trained, the clinical researchers, the clinical operations people want to impose uh, structure and uh, requirements and processes that would, frankly, eliminate the real world nature of what we're trying to, to examine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the classic clinical study ha is based on a hypothesis, and that hypothesis allows us to determine exactly how big or how small the study should be. 
in the real world, it's really difficult to put a hypothesis together because uh, a hypothesis requires procedural control. Mm -hmm. Again, you can't do that in the real world because then it's not the real world anymore. It's, the, it's kind of the difference, the metaphors I use, it's the difference between looking at miles per gallon on an automobile tested on the automobile test track where, where conditions are always perfect and you're controlling for bad weather. Mm. Uh, it doesn't, you know, you don't have crazy weather like in my background here. Yeah. As opposed to the, you know, the Autobahn or the Turnpike where you've got actual traffic conditions where you're dealing with. Mm. It's impossible to control those conditions. And that's exactly what we want to, um, you know, really understand. So it, again, it's a little bit of a, of a, a difficult concept for traditionalists to understand. Mm. I think more and more they are recognizing that this real world stuff may be important. We may not fully understand it, but it does complement information from traditional clinical trials. Yeah, no, no, I hear exactly what you're saying. It sounds like, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough one. And yeah, I think that analogy you've just given about things aren't necessarily the same in the real world as the theory and, and everything else. Um, you know, being a kind of a, a huge boxing fan myself, um, I always remember the Mike Tyson quote of, you know, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Um, and that's kind of, you know, not exactly um, precisely the same, but that's what it's like for, for people when they start businesses, when they run trials, it's, it's kind of that you, you don't know what, it's going to be like until you're actually doing it for real. Yeah, and that uh, the unusual thing is that was our intent to go uh, boldly into this uh, into the unwashed, you know, real world world. Mm. Uh, but in, in, but at the same time, leveraging good scientific processes to the extent possible, we want to gather the best possible data to be able to describe what's happening out there. But mm -hmm. we have to be very tempered very um, transparent in how we describe what we're, what our conclusions are because mm. there may be some important statistical limitations to what we can and can't say. At the same time, you know, there's been a, a tremendous evolution over the last, uh, really just the last few years where um, data is better than it's ever been, uh, available data through electronic medical records, through yeah. data sets such that the regulatory authorities are now starting to say, well, you know what? Uh, a a non-traditional approach to clinical development, to drug approval is something that we're thinking, we're thinking uh, you know, quite positively about. You don't always have to do it the traditional way if you've got very, very good data. Mm. And there have been a couple of uh, uh, precedents at this point where the FDA in the US has uh, uh, expanded the label for a product based on diving into a, a real world data set. So wow. tremendous, tremendous progress over the last um, really few years and an amazing evolution over the time that I, you know, first got involved in this uh, 30 odd years ago. Sure. So look, as you said, uh, there's been a couple of um, acquisitions of, of, of your business. Um, most recently, um, you had founded or, or co-founded as um, Continuum, if I'm uh, pronouncing that correctly, uh, or Continuum Clinical, uh, I believe it is. Um, and then there was the most recent acquisition of the, the real world evidence part of the business by Worldwide. So how how did that come about? And, and you know, what made you say, okay, look, I've been through this previously. Um, you know, did I mean, did you know that this was coming? Was it a decision that you set out to, to kind of sell? Or was it you were approached? How did that come about? Yes. Uh, all those things. Um, <laughs> again, the, the theme that, uh, that, that I've um, experienced over the years is that the, the group that I put together tends to grow and grow and grow and is quite mm. successful, but um, it requires a, a pretty major leap to go from a, a relatively small group, even 120 people, mm. to something that can tackle global uh, prospective studies. And, um, and that's where we get to say, look, let, let's find a big brother that can help us do what we do real well, but provides us the infrastructure we need to put things on, on, on steroids, if you will. So, yeah. um, so the latest acquisition was, uh, was one that uh, we were strongly um, thinking about strategically. Mm. At the same time, we did get our, our tires kicked by a few large organizations and, and that kind of spurred us to think a little bit more about it. And to think about the landscape, thinking about the evolu uh, evolving landscape 
And what was the best thing for us? What was the best thing for our, our people, for the acquiring company? And so uh, for all intents and purposes, yeah, we, we got to another plateau. Uh, Continuum was a, a company that truly was a, a bit of a continuum. It had one foot on the uh, clinical side by virtue of, of work that the company, that actually Continuum continues on with. Continues yeah. On. And was I'm, that, I'm, I'm guessing that, that that name was partly for that reason, that it was a bit of a, a continuum. <laughs> absolutely. It was one foot on the clinical side by virtue of patient recruitment, which the company has continued. Mm. One foot on somewhat of the medical affairs slash commercial side, we had brought in one of my former colleagues to head up a medical of, medical communications group. Yeah. And our the group that I was most uh, familiar with was, again, associated with this evolving real world evidence practice. And that was the group that that uh, was was parceled off and sold to worldwide mm. um, but yeah we were again this area has been evolving uh, it's something that that many CROs are, are quite interested in and most of them recognize that you've got to do it a little bit differently um, it's difficult to I think many CROs think about you know make or buy and making a, a group like this from scratch within a CRO is is challenging mm. you've got traditional infrastructure that's focused almost entirely on, on traditional randomized clinical trials. To depart from that is, uh, is a challenge. So it's much easier for a, a CRO to grab a, uh, you know, a viable concept already and, uh, and kind of build from that, which is what, uh, what, what Worldwide has done. And uh, again, it's, it's going quite well as far as exactly what our aspirations were to globalize this, yeah. to get additional people to help out but also to focus in on what we do well and, and that's uh, still somewhat unique relative to traditional studies. Sure. So look, I mean, as you discovered, look, it's, it's now, it's going quite, quite well. Um, how were you guys perhaps impacted by uh, the, the pandemic, you know, um, paint a picture of thing, how things perhaps changed and, and what you've learned about yourself in, in this time. Cause I know that, you know, talking about uh, reluctance to change earlier on, there's probably been a much more acceptance to change over the last uh, year or so. But, you know, what have you, you learned about yourself and, and what challenges have you faced al along the way? Because it, it's never as plain sailing as what people necessarily see from the outside. And um, yeah. so it'd be interested to, to hear what you've kind of, the, the biggest hurdles that you've had to overcome uh, over the last year or so. Well, first of all, I, I will say that my, you know, we're very fortunate here. We, you know, it, and the industry is very fortunate. I think ultimately, Actually, the life sciences industry is is responsible for maybe even you know curtailing this pandemic. So it's it's a mm. pleasure to work in this field. Uh, from a personal standpoint, my wife is an absolute saint because she doesn't have to, you know, she has to deal with me twenty four seven pretty much. <laughs> uh, I think I, I I was able to uh, document that in twenty nineteen I traveled one hundred and twenty seven thousand miles for business, and Holy in twenty twenty. Wow. In really just the first couple, three months, it was like 20,000. So yeah, I, I don't travel as much. I haven't missed it all that much, surprisingly, or maybe not so surprisingly. Mm. You know, if it weren't for technology, if it weren't for, uh, you know, video conferences and things like that, mm. it would have been a lot more challenged. But um, everyone seems to have adapted to it nicely and uh, things get done. I think the biggest impact that we've seen, again, you know, going back to my theme about the real world, well, the real world has changed quite a bit. Patients aren't seeing their clinicians in the same way that they normally would. So yeah. many of the studies that we did, many of the studies that were that uh, were in progress uh, at the start of the pandemic, you know, we really had to take a step back and think about, you know, what we were documenting. It used to be looking at patterns of care, patterns of of treatment and mm. uh, the consequences of those in the real world. Well, if indeed we're constraining those patterns of, of care, we're uh, constraining the nature of the, the patient and clinician interaction, would that have an impact on treatment outcomes? And indeed, that's been a, a theme that our that many of our clients have been very interested in. You know, I guess you could say it's the new normal, but what are the outcomes associated with uh, pandemic constrained uh, healthcare in a variety of different therapeutic areas. Mm. Uh, so, you know, COVID by and large uh, you know, didn't, you know, again, impacted us in terms of maybe changing some of the analytical themes we were focusing on. 
and certainly change the nature of our interactions with clients. Um, but we're busier than ever. Uh, and uh, I think as things are starting to maybe get back to a little bit normal, some of the, the, uh, the rates are going down, hopefully to stay. Um, the importance of the real world is, is, again, more important than ever. And, uh, and along, you know, over the course of the last year, I think there's been maybe more of a comfort with diving into available data mm. because you don't have to, you know, you know for as a CRO, uh, we don't want our staff exposed to any potential risky situations. We don't want them going out to sites. So we have to acquire data in very creative, but high quality ways as well. Yeah. Again. Technology is improving. Things are uh, along the way improving so that now the uh, ability to characterize what happens in the real world is perhaps a little bit easier. Um, telehealth is happening, spurred perhaps by COVID, but I don't think things are going to change all that much back to the way they were before. Mm. Uh, so again, it's it's a it's a fascinating time, and uh, you know, fortunately, from a personal and professional standpoint, and and I know how challenging this has been for many sectors of the population, but, um, but uh, I've been personally and professionally lucky. Yeah, no, I think, you're, you're, yeah, you're right. There is a, a few things that have uh, changed and, and the innovation is, is huge. Um, as you say, tele, telehealth. Um, I was speaking to a guy just recently who's almost launched a, a whole new business with a, an amazing business um, sort of plan that he's sort of raising funds for at the moment. And um, yeah, if that kicks off uh, well, I'm sure he'll be on to a huge success. Um, so that'll be out on the show fairly soon also. But um, I, I, I'd have to mention, James, you know, one of the things that, that I've also noticed is that the, you know, patients are kind of important in healthcare and the connectivity that patients have with each other and with other, um, other stakeholders in the healthcare ecosystem is better than ever. And, and I think that's been something that's been, you know, maybe a saving grace for, uh, for healthcare, that the connectivity between patients and their, and their providers, maybe not the same physical contact as before, but the ability to interact, uh, you know, through technology, again, it, it's, it's some, you know, it, it provides for some fascinating new business opportunities. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's important, you know, for us not to lose sight of the fact that, you know, we do this ultimately to improve patient care. Mm. And um, and patients have obviously uh, you know had an important stake in it and and again I, I just point to the importance of technology I see a lot of different businesses uh, starting up as well even different designs for for studies that that used to be very much dependent on the patient going into the physician mm. now there are sightless studies or virtual studies and yeah there are and the, the nature of the CRO industry is 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 uh, transforming as well. Definitely. Well, I, I guess um, also you, you touched on it a moment ago, you know, we are see, starting to see some light at the end of the tunnel or certainly some promising news um, come out on a daily basis um, over here in the UK, you know, we're rattling through vaccinations um, you know, we're starting to get told that lockdown restrictions will, will get eased. You know, there's still no beer taps running, um, which a lot of people are, are looking forward to. Um, but like, how are things going at your end? And what are you looking forward to when, I guess, restrictions do relax even more and we start to get back to normal? Because, you know, I think we, we touched on it earlier that, you know, you, you're a, a great believer in balancing, you know, work and work life and, and also sort of family life and, and enjoying life um, as well. You know, what is it that you will be looking forward to increasing your activity on outside of the, the work uh, world when, um, when, we, we, when we do get back to normal? Yeah. Um, well, I, again, I'm, I'm planning on going back out there. Um, uh, hopefully, on a, I, I used to be out uh, in the Colorado area on a monthly basis. Not that it was all pleasure. I, fortunately, again, tech, thank, thank uh, for technology, I was able to do a lot of work in a, just a different location. I've always yeah. been remote. Our, our headquarters is in uh, the North Carolina area of the states. We've got offices mm. all over the world, but uh, fortunately, I've been able to stay in the Chicago area or Colorado. So yeah. I'll probably be visiting out there, doing a little bit more, more skiing, a little bit of hiking over the summer. Um, mm -hmm. In the summer, I, uh, I I missed it last summer due to COVID. Was uh, playing uh, adult league uh, American baseball, nice. and uh, I hope to be able to remember how to do that uh, this coming summer. 
Um, beyond that, I, you know, I, I think I mentioned to you, James, that, uh, well, I used to be a, a rock and roll star, not really a star, but I used to play in uh, <laughs> different bands. And uh, being closed up and not having the opportunity to even, you know, practice with my, uh, my colleagues, mm. uh, I, I found uh, Apple's Garage Band a program on an old Apple computer I've had for, for several years, and I played around with that. So I, I you know, I exercised my creative side. I don't know if I'll continue to do that. Hopefully we'll be able to, you know, be, uh, be live, uh, you know, going forward. But, mm. but yeah, I mean, that, that's the kind of thing that I think is uh, exercise my right brain as well as my left brain. Great to hear it. Well, look, I know that you did promise me that you'd perhaps be able to supply royalty-free music for the podcast at some point. So, um, yeah, when, once I've sampled your work, maybe I'll take you up on that. But um, no Jeff, obligation. You know, it's it's good to keep um, yeah body and mind active. I know that my my dad has recently um, taken up the ukulele. He's part of a group, and they've been rehearsing remotely through Zoom and, and things. So, yeah, I think you're you're spot on. Yeah, I I actually learned how to play the ukulele. But oh, uh, that's another story. There you go. It's um yeah, I, I don't I mean the amount of instruments my my dad has taken up in, in recent time is um yeah crazy and he's into his squash pickleball which I'd never even heard of um prior to him saying it. But um yeah, I guess you've got to keep active and um look I, I think that that's how you, you have a balanced life. But Jeff, it's been a pleasure having you on the show and sort of sharing your your story. Um, look, if anyone does want to sort of reach out to you, whether they've got, you know, questions about real world evidence and, or, you know, what you guys are doing at, at Worldwide, um, is LinkedIn the, the best place to, to shoot you a message or? Yeah, LinkedIn works well. I've got my contact information there. I mean, again, it's been a pleasure to be in this industry and, and you know, going back to your first question, James, never would have imagined I'd be doing what I've been doing reasonably successfully for the last 30 years go go figure so yeah i tell my my sons all the time is you know find something that you're really passionate about it and it may not be anything that you would have predicted you would have been involved with but Mm. uh it's been it's been a real pleasure and yeah it's obviously something i like to talk a fair amount about about uh, the industry always happy to chat with uh, anybody that uh, can tolerate me well, it's been a pleasure having you on board. And I'm sure there'll be plenty of people you know, interested to hear your story. And it's, you know, one that, you know, just shows that success breeds success. And, you know, the way you speak about the industry now, as you say, probably isn't something that you envisaged 30 years back. Um, but, you know, clearly by doing well, bit by bit, it's, you know, spurred you on and, and to do bigger and better, better things, all, you know, each step along the way. Yeah, I, I think the key thing is to be, creative, be opportunistic, uh, always think about, always, th- always kind of take, look at things and then maybe turn them on their side in terms of, you know, how, what's another way to think about these things. And, mm. and again, I've had maybe one or two or maybe three good ideas in the last 30 years. And, and I guess if, if it's, if I've done one thing right, it's being lever- leveraging at least a couple of those good ideas. Amazing stuff. Well, uh, Jeff, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Uh, you and I will no doubt keep in touch, but um, thanks again for joining us. My pleasure, James. Good man.